Uh, we're okay, sir. Okay, thank you. So uh, good morning and welcome to a webinar conversation uh, brought to you by the Ateneo Department of Sociology and Anthropology in partnership with the University for Peace, the Nippon Foundation, and the Asian Peace Builders Scholarship Program. So today's conversation will focus on the concepts of deglobalization, dissent, and democratization. It uh, will basically highlight uh, the changing character of development perspectives and projects within the context of deepening, expanding, and intensifying globalization processes. We intend to address two questions today. The first one, what is deglobalization? and in what ways it is a form of expression or expression of dissent. To what extent does globalization reproduce and reinforce existing inequalities and injustices? In the context, the second question, in the context of, the, of Asian societies, how do development initiatives undermine democratization? And on the flip side, in what ways do development initiatives strengthen democracies? We have two distinguished speakers for this morning's conversation. The first one is Dr. Herbert Docena. Dr. Docena is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He was formerly a visiting researcher at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton from 2019 to 2020. And he earned his MA and PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. In his presentation for this morning, he will be focusing on and showing us how what he calls neoliberal corporate driven or profit oriented globalization has undermined democratization and created the conditions for the rise or resurgence of populist authoritarian movements and regimes. In order, according to him, to effectively counter authoritarianism and to promote democratization, he proposes a different kind of globalization, a globalization that is people-oriented. So without further ado, I now turn you over to Dr. Ducena. Good morning, Dr. Ducena. Good morning, um, Dr. Liviste. Um, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm really happy to join you today. Um, and to be on the same panel as Dr. Sabur and Dr. Leviste. Dr. Leviste has asked me to speak on the question of democracy um, and its relationship with deglobalization and therefore also globalization as well as resistance or dissent. Can you, before I proceed, can you hear me all right? Is my audio uh, clear? Loud and clear, Dr. Dissent. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think this is definitely a very important and very timely topic because as you all know fully well, democracy is very much under attack around the world. I had just come back from the United States where as you might have heard, you know, um, is my screen being shared already? No, no. Are you seeing my screen right now? Uh, not yet. Oh, okay, um, I think, sorry, let me, let me deal with that. What about now? There you go. Yes. Okay, yeah, so I was just saying that the, um, the question of democracy is certainly very timely. And I had just come back from the United States where as you might have heard, um, unidentified officers in camouflage gear um, paramilitary officials essentially had been snatching demonstrators off the streets of Portland and taking them away in unmarked vehicles. Very much like what Marcos's henchmen used to do under martial law in the Philippines um, in the 1970s. And of course, I'm now here in the Philippines where as you might have heard or where as you might know, uh, a so-called anti-terror law has been passed um, the country's biggest broadcast station has just been shut down, and one of the country's most famous journalists, Maria Ressa, is under attack. Today, um, trying to answer, uh, although a bit uh, uh, indirectly, uh, trying to answer uh, Dr. the questions Dr. Leviste posed, 
I'm going to share with you what I think all why all this has been happening in the Philippines, not so much the U.S., um, but why democratization, so quote unquote democratization, has been rolled back in the country. Why authoritarianism is on the rise, and what I think we can do about it. Um, how do we counter dictatorship or promote or deepen democracy? And I'm going to argue that deglobalization or a different kind of globalization is central to that. Um, in so doing, however, I should stress that I'm not going to be saying anything new um, or groundbreaking in the short 30 minutes that I have. Um, so much has been written on this topic um, by you know, like scholars like Dr. Walden Bellio, Dr. Curato, and other scholars in that wonderful volume she edited on Duterte, um, Dr. Tihanki, and so on. So we now have the benefit of learning from other scholars and standing on their shoulders. The only thing that I would do is to bring in some additional ideas or data, data that I have only recently collected um, to support or to flesh out what many others have already said on the question. Okay, so the question is why is democracy, or to be more precise, a particular kind of democracy, what scholars have called low intensity democracy, limited democracy, or formal democracy, why is this kind of democracy being eroded today? Why is it that we have leaders promoting authoritarianism, um, gaining so much support? And um, there have been at least two popular or common sense answers to that question, as, as I understand it. And, there are obviously more complicated ones or um, varieties of these questions. The first explanation is essentially that um, is what I call the fake news or disinformation explanation, which is the idea that leaders like Duterte and Trump gained, have gained so much support because they spread falsehoods or because there's been this orchestrated uh, massive disinformation campaign using Facebook and other social media that have led people to believe certain wrong things and ended up making them support um, people like Duterte. That would be the first popular explanation. The second common sense or popular explanation is what I call the charisma or the personal quality explanation. Essentially that the answer, their answer being that Duterte and Trump have gained support because there's something about them. There's something about the way they talk, about the way they act, that draw people to them or that made them so appealing. They've been tough talking, they're populists and they strike an anti-establishment post or they're both political outsiders and that has helped gain um, support according to that explanation. Now those explanations um, also imply um, a common solution on how to counter authoritarianism, which is essentially if the problem is that people were exposed to fake news, they were, um, they were subjected to this disinformation campaign, then the solution is to educate people to counter this information and to fight fake news or to fight populism, right? That, that, that's sort of implied in, in this explanation. I think there's something, I, I definitely think there's something to these explanations. They're not simply falsehoods. No, there really seems to have been an orchestrated disinformation campaign and an effort to spread, uh, spread fake news by Duterte. Um, I think some scholars have documented that. And Duterte does in fact speak in a very particular way, in a way that is, um, you know, that has made many people uh, support him. But I think that these, uh, these, these explanations are still incomplete or partial because they don't quite explain two things. One, they don't quite explain why is it that so many people were so receptive or willing to believe fake news in the first place? Why is it that so many people found that being anti-establishment or being populist so appealing? Why were so many people receptive to populist demagoguery? All right. Okay, can you hear me all right? Is, is everything okay? I don't hear. <laughs> it's hard to, to yes. just be giving this yes. monologue. Okay, I'll continue. All right. I think uh, okay yeah so what was it that just was it that people were just victims of deception so they were vulnerable to to being um, to being lied to are they were they just being stupid or naturally gullible were they just being quote unquote bobotantes as they're called here in the Philippines uh, was it, were these the reasons 
personally, I find these explanations hard to believe, you know, that people were just victimized or dece deceived because I think that tends to exaggerate the power of Duterte and his operatives, and it underestimates the agency of Duterte supporters. I also find the explanation that people were being gullible or being bobotantes unsatisfying because there's no reason to believe that people today are necessarily more or less intelligent than people 10 or 20 years ago. And yet over the same period, we have seen significant political change. So we need to go deeper into that. And so I think, I think, I personally think that a more satisfying explanation can be found not by looking into the personal traits of Duterte or um, dictators or aspiring dictators or of the individual intellectual capacities of voters, but by looking into the economic and social conditions that people have faced or have been experiencing in recent decades. And this is where the question of globalization or of neoliberal globalization comes in, as I shall explain um, in a bit. So um, yeah, let's, let's, let's ask that question. What were the economic and social conditions in the Philippines in the last several years or so, or decades? How have people's lives actually changed in recent history? Now, um, there's a usual story. You know? The usual answer to these questions is that nothing has qualitatively changed in the Philippines. Or things just changed for the worse. You know? The poor remained poor, or they got poorer, even got poorer. The rich remained richer or they got richer, but the country has remained essentially unchanged. In the words of some, um, of, some of our friends, no, the, the, the country has remained semi-feudal or semi-colonial, or for others, it's remained backward capitalist. There are more and more OFWs, yes, the economy has been growing, but essentially there has been no fundamental economic transformation. Right? People just suffered more and more over the years. This, this seems to be the conventional view you know, on the streets and among many activists, including myself, I would say in the past. Um, and in general, it's not a false picture. It's not entirely wrong. You know? Many have remained poor. Poverty remains widespread today in the Philippines, just as in the 60s or 70s. The Philippines remains underdeveloped or backward compared to many of our neighbors like Japan or Singapore. But at the same time, I think this picture or this story also obscures much that has actually happened or that has actually changed since the 1960s and the 1970s. And this is what I'll go into. Because in the past year, um, I've had the opportunity to, I've had the time and the chance to look more deeply and more systematically at the economic data over the past decades, precisely because I'm trying to figure out what has changed um, in terms of our economic conditions. And I have spent weeks going over census data, various other reports, other government data about the structure of the economy, land tenure, social services, and so on, to try to have a better idea of the socioeconomic changes that have taken place in the run up to the Teltes election in 2016. And I found, based on still preliminary analysis, you know, to, 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 put the, to put it simply, that so much changed actually that the story of what has happened over the years or of how economic and social conditions in the Philippines have changed is a little more, is a little better than it seems, uh, or as, you know, as, as I myself have come to understand, as I myself previously understood. Based on my reading of the data and a few scholars, and as a few scholars have actually suggested before me, the Philippine economy has actually gone through a dramatic and perhaps still under, underappreciated transformation over the past three or four decades. In the past 30 to 40 years, in part through the efforts of the Philippine state and in part through larger um, dynamics, economic forces such as globalization, the Philippine economy has actually been significantly restructured and the country's role in the global division of labor has actually been changed dramatically, I would say, from one dependent on agriculture and exporting primary products to one dependent on exporting semiconductors, high-tech exports, and other kinds of medium or high-tech exports, and of course, labor. 
let me break this down um, in the little time that I've had. I might go quicker than I should, um, but we can always discuss this more later in the open forum or um, later out after the seminar. But let me show you a couple of slides here. And some of these are already well known, others are less well known, anything they're worth um, emphasizing. So over the past 40 years, what have we seen? We've seen, as this graph shows, a declining share of agriculture in output. This is already widely known, um, but yeah, it's worth underscoring that in the 1960s and 70s, around 30% of Philippine output or value added in the GDP, basically that's how much um, a sector is adding into the, to the wealth that's produced in the entire economy. That was 30% in the 1960s and the 1970s. Today, guess what, what that figure is. It is less than 10% today. And as of 2016, it's probably even less, uh, that, that figure is probably even smaller today. We've also seen, um, and this is also very much well known already, a transformation of the economy from a largely service into a largely service oriented economy. Today, service accounts for 60% of all value added produced um, in, um, according to um, economic statistics. We've also seen some very limited degree of industrialization. Now, this is a little tricky um, because clearly as this graph shows, industry um, still accounts for a smaller share of GDP, but it has been growing compared to, um, compared to uh, agriculture. And it's stagnant in relative terms, but increasing in absolute terms so that you will see that in the graph that um, in absolute terms, GDP um, contribute uh, uh, the value added contributed by industry to the GDP has been growing. And there's what I call um, there, there just is limited. There's not only some limited industrialization, but the changing nature of manufacturing or of industry in the country. As this graph shows, um, the country is actually producing increasingly more complex goods. No, from the in the past. Manufacturing tended to consist mostly of food, beverages, and tobacco. Basically, these are low-tech, low-value-added goods. No? But in recent decades, machinery and transport equipment, surprisingly, have taken up increasingly, uh, increasingly larger share of value added in manufacturing. Right? So that, that, that just shows you that the, even though there has been very limited industrialization, the, the nature of this uh, of the kind of industry that we have has also been um, it hasn't been stagnant okay next we 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 and this is more common we already know we of course know that um we've been selling migrant labor um overseas um, we've been sending many many ofws and their remittances constitute as an uh, increasingly large share of the population um but what is less well known is that in terms of the country's role in the global economy or in the world division of labor, the country is no longer just a producer of primary products, unlike in the 1960s and the 1970s. In those decades, as this, uh, as this graph shows you, you know, this is a, I think this is a very informative graph and it captures something very revealing about the nature of our economy today. In the 1960s and 70s, food exports and agricultural raw materials constituted around 80% of exports, of the country's exports. So we were mainly selling abaca and hemp and, um, and other kinds of primary raw material or raw materials to other countries, mainly the US and Europe and so on. But today, if you will look closely at this graph, it's now manufacturers exports that constitutes 80% of our exports. And the share of agricultural and um, food exports now takes up only less than 10% of our exports. I think that's a very radical transformation. And I think that's something that's not, we, we haven't really been discussing a lot, but I think that's, that's, that's quite big. In addition, it's also worth noting that um, much of our manufacturers' exports, which now takes up like 80% of our exports, are actually medium and high-tech exports, not simply low-tech and low-value added exports, right? Before I proceed, I want to emphasize that I'm not painting, uh, you know, I'm not trying to exaggerate the level of, you know, industrialization of development in the country. I'm just, I'm simply trying to show that 
the economy is no longer what it was in many, many important ways. And I, um, I'll go on to, 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 to discuss what I mean. Oh yeah, let me summarize what, what I've, I've, I've been trying to emphasize. Essentially, what the, what, the, what the data tells us, and I see my time is running very quickly, but what, what the data tells us is that much of the wealth in the country is actually no longer being produced off or through the land or in the countryside. More of the wealth being produced in the country has come to be produced in the towns or in the cities, in the malls, in the banks, in the call centers, in all these uh, um, providers of services, and to a limited extent in factories as well or in the export processing zones. But also, of course, abroad through um, um, the millions of OFWs that we have. Second, a very important point, the Philippines is no longer as dependent as it was. Indeed, you know, I don't even know if we can say we're still dependent on exporting primary products. So that's a very important change. But more than that, this is also something I think very important. What Marx called social relations of production, or the way that we produce, not just what we're producing, but what, how we produce, who gets what, who gets the surplus, and so on that appears to have changed significantly as well. No? If not as fast as it should, but it has changed significantly. How, what do I mean by that? Look at this graph. It shows you that there's now a smaller proportion of tenants among farmers. Why is that important? It's important because tenancy has long been considered by many as a marker of feudalism or the extent to which feudal relations are still dominant in the country. And what do we see? Um, if in the 1940s or 1960s, up to like more than 40% of uh, farm operators or farmers were tenants, today that is less than 20%. So it's like, it's been halved. And it's even more revealing if you look at, that the change has been more dramatic in central Luzon which has long been considered the most feudal or feudalistic region in the country. What do you see in these graphs? In the 1960s, 70%, up to 70%, that seven in 10 farmers were tenants. Today or in 2012, um, where, when the last uh, census was conducted, that's less than 20%. Only one in, uh, one in five or two in 10 are considered um, were our tenants um, in Central Luzon, long considered the most feudal um, um, region in the country. Also worth, worth noting, I think, is um, the increasing mechanization of agriculture, because one of, the, um, one of the facts that's always cited to show that the country has remained um, unchanged is that uh, agriculture has remained backward. But actually, if you look at, for example, this is always shown, uh, the number of tractors per 100 square kilometers of land, that has jumped significantly in 1980, since the 1980s. And there are more and more farms with tractors. So that goes to show how increasingly mechanized agriculture is. And we know that small peasants can afford, can't afford to um, tractors or you know, um, to mechanize agriculture. So I think this is also a sign of the growing capitalist character of agriculture, right? Okay, so enough about that. What, what effect has this all had on people? And here I'm slowly building my argument about what this has to do with Duterte because these changes have had significant um, effects on the way, on what people do, how they survive, how they live. Now, what, what do we see as a result of these broader economic changes? We have seen, and, and this is also well known, that more and more people, a larger proportion of people uh, are fewer, or a smaller proportion of people are, are employed in agriculture. Before, it, around two in three Filipinos were employed in agriculture. Now, that's less than one in three. Okay, or, um, it, more or less the same uh, proportion of people are employed in industry, but more and more people are employed in, in, uh, in services. Um, which is well known. If you combine um, the number of people or the share, uh, the, the, the proportion of people who are employed in agriculture and industry, that's already more than the number of people um, employed in agriculture. 
Okay, but but uh, there are some problems with that data that we can't uh, we can't talk about now. But there's another way of looking at it. I looked at the number of those who are classified as farmers and fishermen, and everyone else. Basically, these are um, productive uh, professionals and managers and so on. Uh, and what do we see? There are now more non-farmers and fishermen compared to farmers and fishermen in the country in absolute numbers. There's, there was a turning point. There was actually a an interesting turn, turning point in the 1980s, in 1982, I think, in which um, after that year or starting that year, if you count everyone in the country, you will find more, um, uh, more people who are not farmers and fishermen. And they are mostly, um, yeah, this graph breaks that down. Uh, I won't be able to go into that. Yeah. Now, what does that mean in terms of class? I think some of you, I don't know if you, um, some of you are students of um, Dr. Nibisa's class must have discussed this already, but class in terms as Marx defined it. Now, how, what does that mean? Unfortunately, government data does not, you know, measure um, according using Marx's conception of class, but it suggests that it suggests one thing very important, you know, that there are more and more members of the working class or more and more proletarians. There's a bigger, there seems to be a bigger working class today. There's another um, very important indicator of that. Um, the government measures uh, how many people are considered wage and salaried workers, unpaid workers, and self-employed. And it shows you that starting in the 1960s, the graph here, in the late 1960s, there are now more wage and salaried workers in the country. The fact that usually these are unpaid, the unpaid family workers, these are the ones who work in the farms, um, who are you know, uh, members of the family of tenant farmers. The fact that it's been declining again shows you all, uh, that relations of production have been changing. And the fact that um, wage and salaried workers now constitute um, the majority of uh, workers in the country, of so-called workers in the country, shows you um, the changing nature of a class composition uh, in, in Philippine society, right? And those figures don't even include um, the OFWs, million, the millions of OFWs, the overseas Filipino workers, many of whom are clearly members of the working class, those uh, seafarers, the domestic helpers, and so on, or otherwise members of the lower middle class or the new middle, if not the upper middle class, right? So we've, we've seen in the last three decades very uh, significantly changed economic and social conditions faced by people. They do th very different things now. They have a very different role in the uh, economic structure. How much time do I have? I think I have 15 more minutes. Is that right, Dr. Diviste? Yes, yes you do, Dr. <laughs> okay. Dicena. Don't worry, just carry on. All right, okay, yeah. So I, I've suggested it. It seems that we have an expanding working class and an expanding expanding ranks of the petty bourgeoisie. Now, something else that has happened that has also had very important uh, implications, I think, is that as a result of these dramatic economic transformations, the fact that capitalism has been developing in the country and that vestiges of feudalism have been eroded, I, I've suggested, has also led to uh, or has resulted in a dramatic increase in the amount of wealth being produced in the country. Now, um, we activists, you know, uh, and I consider myself as one, we like discounting um, GDP, you know, the GDP figures being thrown around by the government because there are lots of problems with it. You know? But objectively speaking, if we, if we use the same definition, what do we see in this graph? GDP growth has been nothing, if not dramatic. It has grown from $28 billion to $300 billion since 1960. That's about a tenfold growth of the economy, right? Let me just emphasize that. The GDP, the, kind, the amount of wealth being produced in the country has multiplied or has grown tenfold or 1,000 times, if I'm, if I'm not sure, 1,000%, if I'm not mistaken. Now, surely that, that's not, that's nowhere like Singapore or Japan or Korea during their periods of growth. 
No, but that's also not something to be underappreciated. It's not Malawi or it's not Congo. That's in fact what I want. Yeah, I, I want to show that. In fact, you know, um, for better or for worse, the Philippine GDP growth rate has actually been higher than world GDP growth rate, and even U.S. G, uh, US GDP growth rate in the last 50 um, or so years. No. What does that mean? That means there has been more and more wealth being produced in the country because of these economic transformations. Oh yeah, and also in, in 2018, we were at, the Philippines was actually um, among the top 10 fastest growing economies. And a large part of that is because labor has been productive, but I'll go back to that in, in, in a bit. Um, yeah, what does that mean? It meant, it has meant that the pie, so to speak, the social pie has been growing larger. But much of that wealth that has been produced has gone to the rich. You know? Basically, the landed class and the bourgeoisie um, uh, or, the, uh, or the business owners. Um, let me just um, show you something. A large part of that has been going to the rich, as usual. But because the pie has been growing, even if you, even if the same group of, of people are um, are getting the same share of the pie, because the pie has been growing, the poorest or the members of the working class have also been uh, receiving or have been gaining marginally. Now, so this this graph shows you the income shares of the highest and lowest ten percent in the country according to to the government. What does it? What what, what can you get from it? It, it basically that the distribution has remained unchanged. No, that the the richest ten percent still get like something like thirty percent of the country's wealth, and the poorest ten percent get something like ten per uh, less than five percent. Um, yeah, and but but because the pie has been growing, that means there have been some improvements in um, in the condition. There's been more income. People have been receiving more income in a way. No, and that shows in the in the fact that the percentage of people living above the poverty line has has uh, increased. More and more people are out of poverty. We, you, you know, like there are lots of problems with these statistics again. But if even just using the same definition, if you look if you look at across the years, you will see that there has been the uh, increase. No, there has been an increase in the percentage of people who aren't considered poor, and there's been uh, you know, uh, material improvements in, in, you know, in their level of, uh, in their uh, living conditions, such as, for example, the number of people who are using basic sanitation services that's also been increasing over the years. So I think it would be um, simplistic and misleading to say that people have simply remained poor, no? This is, again, I'm not going, I, I, I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that people's lives are suddenly so much better now. But all that I, that I want to emphasize is that it's not quite the same as, um, as they, their la people's lives have not been the same as in the past, right? But there's something very important that happened. No? And this is where um, the role of government comes in, the role of neoliberalism and of globalization comes in. No? Why? Because normally um, these developments, integration into the world market, and even capitalist development, the expansion of the working class and of the middle class, normally that's accompanied by the expansion of social protections, greater state intervention in the economy, the, in the emergence of some kind of welfare state. That's the experience of the West. That's the experience of, uh, of many other countries that went through um, what, we, uh, what the Philippines went through. But that is not what happened in the Philippines. From the 1970s to the 1980s, this was the heyday of well, what's been called neoliberalism. No, the state, the Philippine state, failed, or maybe, uh, or maybe the better term is refused to provide social welfare or protect workers from the market, from the vagaries of the market. Instead, the state rolled back or failed to build. This the kind of welfare state that you know that they built, uh, other capitalist states built in other countries, and actually went on the attack, attacked workers, no, um, this or tried to disorganize workers. Basically, the Philippine state took part uh, and was instrumental in what I call neoliberal or corporate-driven or profit-oriented um, uh, globalization. 
So even as workers uh, enjoyed limited gains, even as they got like the same share of an expanding pie, uh, they also were exposed. They became, uh, they were also exposed to the vagaries of the market, to the uncertainty that um, the market brings. They were always at cons and they faced the risk of getting fired from their work. Any OFW uh, will tell you how, 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 how difficult this is. And they have the, the, the risk of going bankrupt anytime, no? of falling back to the ranks of poverty because of the lack of social safety nets or social protection. Okay, I, I, I didn't have time to, to show you, um, to get data about the extent to which social services have declined in countries like the Philippines. But I think this is a very, um, very useful indicator, the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people, and also very relevant today, given um, in, in light of the pandemic. What does it show you? Of course, um, this is very incomplete. And this is a sign of the declining um, spending on healthcare by the government, or the failure of the government to keep up with um, the growth on, in the population and the growth in the economy. So what does the graph tell you? Tell, uh, what does the graph tell us? It tells us that there has been, there's actually been fewer hospital beds per 1,000 people in the Philippines. Look at this other table. It shows you the number of government or um, beds in public hospitals from the 90s to, the, uh, to 2015. What does it show you? Basically, that the number of beds, of hospital beds provided by the government has actually declined, has actually, yeah, has, actually, has again declined, as, as was shown in the other graphs. So this is one of those um, signs of how inadequate or of how the state failed to provide the kind of protection that, um, that uh, states usually provide, but with neoliberalism, they refused or failed to provide. Another um, indicator, another very useful indicator is this uh, is the coverage of social insurance, pro the percentage of the population that's covered by social insurance programs. Unfortunately, the data here is very limited, but what does it show you? Less than 10% of the population actually receive social insurance. So what does that mean? It means that millions of people became proletarianized or became part of the petty bourgeoisie, but they also became more insecure, more exposed to the vagaries of the market, more insecure and unprotected from whatever shock they may experience. So I can, um, this is very hard to measure, but I can only imagine that as a result, social anxiety also increased massively over the last um, two or three decades. Essentially, millions of people were left to fend for themselves as government failed or refused to provide social welfare or protection as a result of neoliberal globalization. So the result was a complicated mix of rising, if limited mobility, or pro even prosperity for many, combined with widespread insecurity and anxiety. No, and this is why I think um, this is very important. This newly affluent, you know, relatively uh, richer, quote unquote, uh, individuals, you know, they, they, they actually sought reforms. The past uh, 20 or so years, we've seen uh, many um, mem uh, members of the middle class, you know, fighting for reforms. And these are expressed in, in, in these anti-corruption movements, in the desire for a clean government, for the delivery of better services, for an end to corruption, for the country to be like Singapore, but they've been constantly disappointed by, by GMA, by Noy Noy Aquino, and, and so on. Now, the left could have easily taken advantage of that, this frustration, but this was the other problem. No? The, the, uh, um, for reasons that we can't go into and that I have to, um, to rush, uh, to, to, to cover very quickly, no? the working class was, ex had been extremely disorganized and very weak um, and became increasingly weaker over the past several decades. The, the next couple of um, tables or slides will show you how low the level of unionization is in the country, which is usually a marker of how organized the working class is. Um, this one shows you how just 
you know, how, how very few, the level of militancy of workers, because you will see here that there's been a declining number of strikes over the last uh, 20 or so years. Even worse than there were actually fewer strikes in the Philippines compared to China and Indonesia and Thailand. We had one of the worst, and the, the, one of the worst, the lowest number of strikes in, in the region probably in the whole world. We had one in 2013. I think there, were, there was even a year na zero talaga siya. Um, so that just goes you to show, that just goes to show how weak, how extremely disorganized the working class was. As a result, the left, I would, uh, ar I would argue also became extremely fragmented and marginalized politically. They, uh, for reasons that I can't go into now, I think there's a relationship between the, the strength of the working class and the organization of the working class and of the political left. Um, so as a result, the left has also become fragmented and marginalized. It's unable to take advantage of the democratic opening that took place in the 1980s. It's unable to make a dent in electoral politics and it forced the left to make all sorts of compromises with different factions of the ruling class. We know that certain groups allied with Villar, with Noy Noy, with the Aquino administration, making it hard for the left to differentiate themselves from the establishment or from the mainstream, you know, in, in, in a context in which people were becoming more and more angry at the establishment, right? I think I'm, 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 I'm almost out of time. Let me just have like two minutes just to recap what I've been arguing. I think the situation was, was, was this, no? Economic and social conditions change over dramatically over the last uh, three or four or five decades. We've seen an expanding working class and uh, petty bourgeoisie. I think the, the data indicates that. We've seen growing but limited affluence on the, on, on the part of millions of people. But we've also seen growing insecurity and anxiety as the state failed to provide or refused to provide social protections um, in part because of neoliberal globalization. We've seen a growing demand for reforms constantly disappointed by successive administrations. We've seen a weak working class and also a weak, if not discredited left, you know, compromising with um, the establishment with few exceptions. These were the very conditions when Duterte came out of nowhere and started orchestrating these fake news oper operations struck an anti-establishment post, railed against the oligarchy, presented himself as the solution to corruption, um, and, and so on. These were the conditions under which he was able to gain support. Now, many people were inclined to believe him or to find him appealing. They became vulnerable to fake news, I would argue, precisely because of these conditions. The left could have taken advantage of that insecurity, of that dissatisfaction brought about by these broader economic transformations. But thanks to the weakness of the working class and of the left, they were unable to do that. So this brings me to the last question. Sorry, I know I'm over time. One minute. Um, what needs to be done? How can we counter this? How can we uh, deepen democracy, as some people put it? No? How can we um, defend the limited democratic gains that we have won? Well, I think, I think it should be obvious by now but that um, exposing fake news is important or educating people is important, but that can only go so far. If part of the cost was the growing insecurity and anxiety of people, then we need to provide or provide greater security and protection for people. That necessitates countering neoliberalism. That necessitates pushing for a very different kind of, of globalization, what I call people-oriented and um, people-oriented deglobalization. If part of the cause was the weakness or the fragmentation of the left, then we need a stronger, or of the working class, then we need a more organized, a stronger working class, and we need a more organized and stronger left. Right, I'll, I'll just end there. I'll have more to say, but I have more to say, but um, I've gone way over time. I'm very sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ducena, for a very comprehensive and insightful presentation. We now proceed to our second uh, resource speaker for this morning, none other than Dr. Shuti Sabur. Dr. Sabur is uh, currently an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Coordinator of Social Sciences 
in the Department of Economics and Social Sciences at Brack University in Bangladesh. She obtained her PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore, and she also graduated in anthropology from the University of Dhaka, obtaining her second MA in cultural dynamics from Hiroshima University in Japan as well. So for the past few years, Dr. Sabur's core research interests include the Bangladeshi metropolitan middle class, their lifestyle, changing gender roles, and their social and transnational networks. She has been an active member of the country's oldest and largest women, women's organization since she was 16 and has always been very vocal about social inequalities and gender justice, both in academia and beyond. As an activist and academic based in Bangladesh, she has been drawn to recent social movements and has written on the Shahabag uprising, the gendered construction of the nation, and the culpability of left liberal forces in perpetuating structural violence. She is currently working on her upcoming book, Marriage and Friendship, Social Networks of the Bangladeshi Affluent Middle Class. And for this morning, she will be talking about how women's movements have persisted as dissident voices and as an indispensable force for democratization, holding transnational bodies, the state, and other factions of civil society accountable. Without further ado, Dr. Sabur. Uh, Shuti, sorry, you're on mute, Dr. Sabur. Okay. There you, you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good. One second. Um, thank you, Dr. Leviste, for inviting me to the class. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, it's an honor to present. Um, and uh, I must uh, say this because uh, Dr. Leviste and I did my our PhD at NUS, and so it, in a way, it's it's coming to a fruition how we uh, saw so, uh, so social theory and what we are trying to do uh, in our lives now. So it, in a way, it, it was a, it's a good opportunity to do looking back how uh, we made sense of things that, that we learned and how we are implicating those theories and how we are trying to create um, new theories uh, where we are standing. Um, so good morning. Um, as uh, Dr. Levisi told you that I'm teaching at Bragg University, Bangladesh. Now, Bragg being the largest NGO um, in the world and uh, Bangladesh being the crucible of development, uh, I am often expected to talk about development. Now, no one uh, ever asked how, about how these developments were made possible in the very first place. What were the forces uh, behind this development or simply or even to uh, whether it's possible to talk about um, talk about uh, any transformation change uh, in the developing country outside the uh, outside the the very um, narrative of neoliberal development now since we are talking about deglobalization decent and de democratization it's time to bring back the old fashioned social movement, which I, I really, really uh, have invested my life in um, and, and bring that back um, at the center of the discussion. I'll present part of my long-term uh, ethnography, gender social movement in Bangladesh and um, the changing political field. And this paper would explore how movement-based organization have persisted as dissident voice and is an indispensable force for democratization, holding the transnational bodies, the state and other factions of civil society accountable, even after being de-radicalized. So we are talking about two things, how women's movement were de-radicalized, but at the same time remained as the dissident voice um, to question this, this uh, neoliberal paradigm and, and question the development itself and, and shape the field. As a post-colonial anthropologist, I think it's important to posit myself why and from where I'm coming from. Um, and uh, as we have learned in our theory classes that you really need to talk about your um, 
ontological experiences and how you're creating this epistemology and being a very uh, uh, a loyal subject to Bodian um, thoughts, I would, uh, I would say that my reflexive and the feminist turns has shaped the way I understand theoretical practices. And that marking decolonization as an active ongoing process, being a native with embodied lived experiences and a circumstantial activist in professional sense, as Marcus would suggest, I have had to reinvent the field as a fluid space. Ethnography as resistance for me was more than a stylistic engagement uh, or exercise. It is a conscious political project to document the history of our present, painstakingly building the repositories from old and forgotten archives, documents and bi biographies, tracking genealogies of individuals and collectives, revealing the history of everydayness of political and resistance. Now, my modest attempt here is to interrogate the liberal practices and uncover solidarities and tension that has shaped <clears throat> the form and content of women's movement in unstable political field. Here, the field is structured and unequal. Uh, and, and I will argue from um, following the Raka, uh, Raka Ray and, um, and Bodio, uh, that when we talk about the field, we are essentially um, talking about to, uh, unstructured, unequal, and socially constructed environment within which organizations are embedded and to which organization and activists constantly respond. Maneuvering forms of capital at, to occupy position within this hierarchical structure. The women's organization I explore can be understood as emplaced within a fragmented, uh, heterogeneous, and fluid field, where they, they have a certain acceptable and legitimate ways of doing politics. This is also where power, capacities, and opportunities are unevenly distributed, enabling us to understand the complicated everyday transaction that takes place among the actors, where that is, women's organizations, civil society organizations, donor agencies, political parties, the state and transnational forces, even as their transaction to control the field. Now, women's movement have been part of the larger um, nationalist struggle even before the inception of Bangladesh. The left imagination that fu fueled anti-colonialism in Bengal in 1940s, as well as post partition nationalist movement in East Pakistan and Bangladesh in 1960s and 70s had brought women at the center of the revolutionary struggle. Women were at the forefront of liberation war in 1971 against Pakistan, fighting, nurturing the wounded, salvaging the war-torn families. Women's organization emerged as an effective political force in 1970s to address women's issues in newly independent Bangladesh. The most radical force within this post-independent women's movement invested their energies in rebuilding the war-torn nation, working closely with the state to secure women's right as full citizens, placing them in a powerful but ambivalent position. So we see this women or, women's organization uh, in one hand working closely with the nation state, uh, at the same time, they are being the critic and they're pushing the policies, they're, they're articulating what the policies should be, what the demand as new subject of the state itself. And they were talking about the gender parity from the very beginning. This combination with the Cold War battle between the left and neoliberal forces, uh, which the later emerge as triumphant led to the first phase of de-radicalization of women's movement. So I will be talking about different phases of de-radicalization of women's movement and what they have been doing even while the de-radicalization was taking place. Uh, so the subsequent, so what happens in 90, after 1975 and assassination of uh, uh, founder of uh, founding father of nation, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in 1975, uh, we see, uh, a reign of autocratic 
regime, um, first led by Zia Rahman and then by uh, Ishad, uh, actually, ac actually occupying the nation state, the autocratic forces were in power for the longest period of time, almost uh, for one and a half decade. And the subsequent autocratic military regimes, we saw numerous mass mobilization uh, targeting the state and clearly identify enemy uh, for both civil society and women's organizations. So we see the women's organization and civil society mobilizing against the state constant. And there are uh, mass surprising. And by 90s, they, they managed to overthrow the, uh, the autocratic regime, the Ishrat regime. Now, these regimes were aligned with US Saudi interests. And, and I think it's very important to note uh, that how uh, the neoliberal state has been neoliberal state is it very crucial to understand because otherwise it's not possible to even um, think of deglobalization de the way we are trying to conceive uh, now because these are the mechanism of changes that has led to a path of, of, of point of no return and, and what whatever we are seeing today uh, is 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 we are actually leaving the aftermath of Cold War politics and how it de deeply entrenched in our lives uh, as individual and as collective. So what we see, these regimes were aligned with US saw the interest in private capital investment and against the communist bloc. So this is very crucial. So on in one hand, uh, they were uh, aligning with US and Saudi. And on, on the other hand, they were they were against the communist bloc, which is Soviet bloc, which communist bloc was, and I must, uh, because many of you may not know, uh, the India and Soviet bloc helped Bangladesh to uh, in, in liberation. And the first forces to rebuild the nation was this forces. So with the killing of Majib and, and coming of um, autocratic regime, we see the, a paradigm shift. And it is the US who, who the Soviet bloc was uh, waging war against, the Cold War politics was all about, as is taking the place. So we see the defeat of the communist bloc and a rise of this, this US Saudi uh, alliances. And that is what a nation wanted at that point of time, the autocratic regime wanted at that time. Um, and what we see is that, that that this capital investment uh, against the communist bloc and systematically and brutally neutering the left on the ground. So that is also very crucial. So throughout 70s and 80s, there were, there were massive killing, extrajudicial killing of left political pa uh, party members. And they were, um, they were in jail, they were tortured, they, and they were brutally raped. So this is the story that we, we often forget is that neoliberal state is possible because uh, the annihilation of, of radical forces took place at, in, in 1970s and 1980s. And what we see is that it's not only the rise of neoliberal forces, but also this regime was pandering to the Islamist party and the movement vying for legitimization in the face of opposition, pushing women's organization further to the extreme end of the emerging secular Islamist contestation. So the, the whole contestation versus uh, neo, neoliberal versus fundamentalist forces were, were actually, um, how you call it, um, fabricated. So for neoliberal regime so so in a secular country all of a sudden you see this this islamic forces are rising and they are not rising on its own but there's a there's a certain kind of proponent working behind it it was the state who who wanted these groups to rise and there was a massive funding from us and from uh, saudi and 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 that is that is something that we completely forget when we talk about development and when we talk about this neoliberal de development as if it, it just it just fell from the sky it didn't there was a there was a uh, continuous annihilation of radical forces that made what what we have today now 
what happens that after this is that while the left was butchered, massive inflow of capital to support state development projects helped replace the policies of ideology, politics of ideology, with one of entitlement. So the narrative in development is changing. So the when it was a it was more of a donor driven more of rebuilding the state uh, it was a nationalist project it was a it was a national nationalization of different uh, uh, industries after 71 by uh, 19, 1980s what we see is denationalization but we see this massive inflow where people are uh, are are entitled to have the the this uh, factories and occupying the powerful people are occupying these factories, the industries, and there's a personal uh, and private profit property uh, was in a full force. I mean, blooming in a full force, and and it, it's it, there's, there's a handover. So state which was not the industries which was nationalized was denationalized at the same time, and also we see the rhetoric of empowerment taking the center stage. In the development sector, so this is the this is what we call the politics of entitlement, where the ideology was replaced. The state had to present itself as promoting uh, promoting the women's empowerment to the UN donors and the agency to to keep the grants flowing. This led to a proliferation of women friendly legislation like family court, um, affirmative action, and etc. While NGO mushroom to assist donors and the state to deliver services, uh, which Kabir has, uh, Naila Kabir has depicted very beautifully, is that how, how all these NGOs at, was helping out the managerial state who was, who was managing the capital, the aid and the capital that, that, that was flowing within the state system. And NGOs were actually assisting that pro process. So unchecked neoliberal development thus produced the second phase of de-radicalization of feminist politics. Women's organization had no choice but to reckon with the neoliberal forces, replacing left transnational network with UN agencies. So in 19, 1971, all these women's organizations that I was talking, talking about, especially the one I am part of, uh, Bangladesh Mohila Purushot, was uh, was part of the uh, the the women's international and they were part of this um idf widf and all of a sudden we see those those networks um uh, sheffield women's organization those networks are are waning off and they are replaced by the UN agencies and all of a sudden we have to um kind of negotiate for even for the movement i mean People who are not in a set, we are not NGO, NGO, we're not NGO at that point of time. We had to negotiate with the UN agencies and the state for our own existence. Uh, most of this organization may not have been develop, development or service delivery organizations, but they demanded equal rights and resources for women. That is exactly what I meant just now. As the year passed, the demand grew. New projects required permanent staff, both centrally and regionally. So, for this women's organization, was not only working with the state, but also, uh, even though they were not service delivery organization, but like for balanced women pushers like us, we were providing the uh, legal aid. We were pro providing um, the, the shelter for destitute women, um, especially the victim of uh, rape and gang rape and acid survivors. So, these were the demand was growing and. And you had no choice but to actually uh, claim your space within that. So, so you are you are demanding equal right as a women's organization, and you are you also need resources for women, and you have to battle it out because uh, these rights were delivered by the state. It was it was also even mandated. So whether you like it or not, you had to deal with state. You had to deal with the the even agencies, and you had to some way claim your space within that field. So even the field is changed and shifting, uh, the forces are shifting, you really need to, uh, you can be critical of UN agencies, but you still need to negotiate with them. Um, so what we see is that local need and requirements of 1995 
Beijing platform for action drove the women's organization to re register as NGO. So without being NGO as a movement organization or um, uh, what we call at that point of time, um, it, social organization. So there, there was a shift in the lingo in, in the state as well, is that you had to call yourself not a social social organization rather than or movement organization, but you had to call yourself NGO to push for any kind of policy, any shadow report that you wanted to be part of, any status report that you wanted to give um, and present to the, the global audience. It was impossible if you were not registered as an NGO. So what we see, there was a collective decision making process of this movement uh, oriented women's organization who came together and decided they would register as an NGO, but they would retain uh, their uh, movement age. So a uh, big and large NGO, uh, <clears throat> large women's organization like Bangladesh Mohila Purusha, Nari Poko, Ayana Shalish Kendro, these actually could retain its own voice. For the smaller uh, women's organization, it was not possible they were reduced into service delivery organizations. So they were, I mean, for their survival, uh, they, from cooperative status, they become the NGO. And from cooperative and social organizations, we were becoming NGO. Now, all of us, uh, whether we are, are, are doing the development work or not, whether we are interested in a service delivery or not, we had to become part of this big umbrella of NGOs where everything was homogenized. So that is the third phase of de-radicalization that happened within the women's movement, just to sustain. Now, as I was describing, this de-radicalization was not, thus not a linear process. Women's organization of Bangladesh grappled to retain their critical age amidst of, of temptation onslaught of a neoliberal regime. This realignment and configurations have ensured survival at the cost of their radical potential. So you, you could only be a radical within certain limits. You cannot be radical and, and just like go against the state for, uh, full throttle that you used to do in 80s and 90s. It's not possible anymore. You, you are legally bound to be within certain kind of limit. You are answerable. You, you have audit report to write. You have to answer every penny that is coming from. Doesn't matter whether it's coming from your member's pocket. You had to be answerable to the state. And if you were not answering, you, you were held accountable. So what I mean, and so, so the thing is like, of course, the radical potential was com compromised, but women organizations now appearing to acquiesce to the state to fight their battle on their behalf. So what we do now is that it's, it's not that we, we stop doing the, having the movements, we still doing the movements, but the, the radical tone is missing because half our time is spent by, to write the, write the, this, this, this elaborate report, uh, negotiate and lobby and, and, and advocacy. So you can be on the street if your time allows. But what has happened is that um, actually state is not fighting our battle. That's, that's not the case here. State is using women's organization whenever they please, the way, same way they using this Islamist forces whenever they please. So this entrustment to the state has produced a narrative where secular elite, the member of women's organizations, are pitted against the Islamist subaltern, which has been continued since 1980s. Such rendering results in an inherently problematic narrative that only produces scapegoat for the state. Predictably, the history of systematic annihilation of politics for example, by the neoliberal state is obfuscated, appropriating in the process both secular and Islamist populist forces and circumcising all deep resistance. So what I am arguing is that it's not, it's, it's, it's not that left became weak, but there's a systematic annihilation. And it's not about the left, but also uh, liberal forces and other radical forces, both Islamist and non-Islamist, and other populist forces has been circumcised, has been appropriated, has been co-opted by the state itself. 
And this is the neoliberal st state that that is what neoliberal state did in Bangladesh. I, I don't want to generalize this this to every developing countries, but that is exactly what has happened in Bangladesh. And similar cases can be found in Pakistan as well. The populist uprising momentarily revealed renew possi renewed possibility of reclaiming democracy and proclaim a transversal politics that we saw in 1990s, that we saw in Shahbag movement, uh, that we saw uh, like road safety movement. So these are the small parts and the possibilities. It, it, it reclaimed democracy. It tries to rec reclaim democracy and promised transversal, transversal politics. But however, the histories of transaction and realignments that had shaped political field in which populist movements uh, movements emerged and which the uprising ultimately failed to challenge the, the power that be had in shaping the form and content of the movement, ironically, already pre precluded any radical possibilities. The fate of the women's movement in Bangladesh divulges how inherited legacies have an afterlife and regrettably thought attempt to plot different politics in the present. Now that what paved the way of unchecked development and one has to recognize that without this dissident voices, even these changes, minor changes wouldn't have been possible and that paved the ground for, for development to happen. In order to reclaim democracy or any attempt of deglobalization that, that you are studying now will be impossible without retaining uh, this dissident voice alive. So what I am arguing for is, 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 is we revive uh, to have any sort of deglobalization. It is not gonna happen as Asif Bayat says in a, in a slow encroachment, I don't think so. I mean, it's, 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 the world is, is very brutal. I, it, you can, one or two person can slowly encroach and, and, and use the, public property and, and negotiate, have a very uh, interesting, understated negotiation. But I think movement is still needed. And what we are missing in this world is the balance and neoliberal forces could be uh, this omnipresent and, and, and this oppressive, this exploitative. Capitalism uh, is, 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 is absolutely in an unbreathable, created an unbreathable status precisely because the counter forces has been neutered over the period of time. And also all the radical possibilities has been neutered on the ground. So I'll end my conversation here. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sabur. Uh, a lot of substantial takeaways uh, we can learn from. No? So at this juncture, uh, we would like to extend the conversation to our audience. And with the generosity of our resources, resources speakers, we will be going through some of the questions that were posted online, no? the uh, Zoom chat or via Facebook. Uh, there's an interesting question here that is addressed to both speakers. So. Uh, it's up to you who would like to answer first. This has something to do with the relationship between the oligarchy, which both of you touched on no, repeatedly in your presentations, and globalization. The question goes, uh, can the speakers elaborate, please, on the issue of the oligarchy and globalization and the rise of corporate power and corporate capture of development policies in the wake of the state's retreat from its role in creating a more just and equal society. So can we please uh, discuss that more or touch more on that, uh, Dr. Dusena and Dr. Sabur? I'll let Dusena uh, respond to that first. that first. Oh, I was actually going to say you should go first this time. <laughs> okay, um, I, as you prefer. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Dr. Samor? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so uh, uh, Niniu, can you just uh, repeat the question again so that I can frame better? Okay. Uh, yeah. The question goes, can the speakers elaborate please on the issue of the oligarchy and globalization and the rise of corporate power and corporate capture of development policies 
in the wake of the state's retreat from its role in creating a more just and equal society? Okay. Um, there are two things that I, because uh, I'll bring my other work on class here. Um, I think if you're, to, I, I'm not sure whether you are uh, uh, imposing global oligarchy or local oligarchy, because we really need to differentiate between like ol oligarchy in Bangladesh that works in a different way. And if we are talking about the, uh, the configuration of power globally, that, that, that has a very different answer. So I would um, talk from Bangladeshi perspective. Um, what has happened over the period of time is that we, we see this new elite and, and in my discussion in a very limited way, I did talk about how this oligarchic power captured the state. So uh, the state didn't retreat. I wouldn't say the state retreat, but how this oligarchic power captured the state. And it was not only through the, um, uh, how you call it, the autocratic regimes, but even in democratic regimes afterward, how they use this oligarchic power uh, and this, uh, this, this, uh, this huge, um, rise of, of affluent middle classes. So in Bangladesh, uh, let me give you a, a short, short explanation. What happened in Bangladesh in 1971 after, after, the, um, after the liberation war uh, against Pakistan? So in 40s and 60s, this, this, the whole identity of Muslim middle class, uh, emergent Muslim middle class was, was, was at the core of nation formation. And what happens in 1970s, it was not only uh, uh, the middle class, the Muslim middle class, but educated Muslim middle class that we are talking about who are professionals. And 1970s, this, this, it was not the elite who captured the state. It's very interesting, 1971 and afterward, uh, all these companies, all these industries that was left behind behind by the Indians and by the Pakistanis were captured uh, by the state. It was nationalized. Most of this were nationalized. And who were uh, having managing this, 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 uh, this industries were none other than the administrators responsible for those positions. Suppose like the, the, the administrator who was uh, looking after the um, suppose business or or, or, or or policies where we're set as the leader of these industries okay uh, and and at the same time what happens is that the state was managed by the middle class so there was a there was a contestation there's a subaltern first forces Bangladesh was predominantly uh, um, uh, uh, agrarian agrarian economy even in until 60s and 70s, what we see is that the agrarian economy or the subaltern people uh, um, ideologies were defeated by this, this uh, hegemonic power, the hegemonic middle class. And they not only ran the state and the administration, but they also captured these industries as well. So we see a middle class emerging as an oligarchic power, becoming part of the oligarchic power. So that is very important to, uh, I think that that is that is something really, really crucial for about understand uh, the nation formation in Bangladesh and class formation in Bangladesh. But what happens uh, during the 80s and 90s, this unchecked neoliberal capital flow made this new elite, the denationalization not actually made new elite and and we see the millionaires uh, emerging and who were pandering with the people in power for a certain kind of subsidies certain kind of businesses certain kind of yeah, that has happened everywhere in the world it's not only in Bangladesh I don't think it's a special case of Bangladesh so the oligarchic power had a new configuration so we see the new money flowing in and it's not uh, and so uh, people people call uh, development a uh, I think development I see is as an industry. So industry, which had a human face, and then you have capital in the industries. So you had the multinational coming in, you had the, uh, you had the UN agencies are coming in. So there's a new uh, amalgamation of power of this UN bodies, this, this capitalist, and state is managing the capital of, of, of aid and the capital uh, simultaneously and making a certain group of people more rich. And so this, so we see over the period of time, 
middle class and the power of middle class is waning, but corporate middle class, the affluent middle class are, are taking the lead. So elite, elite is slowly and gradually uh, uh, having the pact with the oligarchic power. And now even having a democracy, I, I, I dare not to say that, and I, I shouldn't be uh, addressing the elephant in the room, but, but fact remains is that it's not very different from, from, from what we saw in 80s and 90s. It's not. So it's a different re reconfiguration, but where elite and money talks, which was not the case even in the 80s or even in the 90s, even under the autocratic regime. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but this is, this is, the, this is what tr class transformation or, uh, or nation formation work hand in hand. And, and of course, there's an ideological shift that I have already talked and addressed in my paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabur. Uh, Dr. Dusena. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that I really appreciated Dr. Sabur's uh, presentation. I saw, I, I heard a lot of parallels between um, um, Bangladesh and, and, and the Philippines. I should note, I should have expounded as well. Um, on, um, on the, the weakness of the left here in the Philippines, a large part of that was definitely because of um, processes that you described, which had to do with the state, you know, really um, organizing an all out assault on progressive forces, not just the working class, but also on feminist groups and um, other progressive forces. Um, Going back to the question, I think this is a very important question um, because I think the role of the oligarchy has definitely been central um, in, uh, in, in understanding the developments that we've been witnessing. Um, well, but we, we just need to be a little more careful here um, about you know, what we mean by oligarchy. Um, this is a very vague term. Um, maybe if by oligarchy, um, uh, we're talking about big business, like all these billionaires, uh, real estate magnets, tycoons, you know, um, uh, or landlords. I think we need to, and I guess this is part of the answer, actually, that we've been seeing a changing oligarchy in the Philippines, you know, at least in the Philippines. From its, and, and Duterte's rise, I think, reflects that. If you look at... Um, who were behind the, the oligarchs that were behind Duterte and that um, I suspect is also benefiting from his role, although this is something that uh, I think we need to study deeper that I need to look into, you will see that it's uh, my suspicion or my hypothesis anyway, is that this is a very different group of oligarchs compared to the past. You know, if in the past, um, the Philippine state, you know, presidents like, uh, I don't know, Rojas or, and so on were, um, advancing the interests of big uh, land-owning families. I think, you know, today we're the president Duterte or this government is advancing the interests of a very different group of um, ruling elites, um, so to speak. I, for example, you know, if you look at the list of campaign contributors of Duterte, you will find there among them like Dennis Uy, I think, who all these um, relatively unknown businessmen. Who are now suddenly, um, uh, you know, like who become who, whose businesses are expanding? The um, who else? Florendo. The Florendos. It's not commonly known. Are among the biggest uh, the owners of so, uh, one of the biggest uh, exporters of bananas to China. So I think, and, and that 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 goes to show. You no, know, um, it, it's a reflection of the kind of changes that I was describing earlier. In part because the the economy has been changing. The uh, oligarchs or the capitalists who are dominant in this kind of economy has also been changing as well. And that's being reflected in who is more or who is less powerful among um, these different business factions. No? It's no longer, like, yeah, I think the fact that the Lopezes, for example, were so easily marginalized tells us gives us um, a glimpse into the power dynamics between these different elite factions. Now, I, I don't know if I've answered the question as well. How do we counter this? Um, I think we need to be very careful, um, especially when people like Duterte fashion themselves as anti-oligarchs. I think we've known um, from, we've learned from the experience of Marcos because Marcos was also you know, um, projecting himself as, you know, the great anti-oligarch. And in a way, it wasn't entirely wrong because he was indeed attacking the old oligarchs. 
But I think we need to be careful that he doesn't, in fact, um, only prop up or um, promote the interests of a very different set of oligarchs. Thank you, uh, Dr. DeSena. Uh, there is another question here that uh, is addressed to both of you, and I will read it. No? It's from uh, Professor Mary Roselis. And the question goes, uh, the shift to a services economy is supported by large scale migration by to cities and growth of informal settlements whose now illegal occupants become the underclass daily wage workforce without benefits, suffering constant threats of eviction. Most of these communities are now organized into people's organizations, mostly women led through NGOs and left forces, but not along the traditional labor union lines since they don't have employers, quote unquote. How can the masses of urban poor informal workers who enable cities to operate play significant roles in people-centered deglobalization? So again, may we ask uh, Dr. DeSena first and then proceed to Dr. Sabur. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's definitely a very important question. And I think the Dr. Raselis is talking to, is, is speaking uh, precisely of one of the consequences of the dramatic economic transformations that I had been, I was describing earlier, you know, as, as the country shifts from more, uh, from agriculture to services and to uh, industry, as the country becomes less dependent on um, primary uh, raw materials production and food production, then you will see these millions of people streaming out of the cities, becoming proletarianized, as, as we've seen in the history of capitalism around the world. These are, uh, it would be really interesting you know, to find out the, the life stories of many of these, uh, of, uh, of these people in the city. And I, uh, I, I suspect that they will have something in common. They were all like, either former tenants or they were tied to the soil before. They've been driven out because of land grabbing or because of development projects away from the countryside into the city where they don't have, they can't find employment. So they find themselves cramped together in these um, miserable slums um, or urban poor communities. And yes, I definitely agree with Dr. Rosselis that these communities have a very important role to play. They cannot be and should not be organized um, like workers because their um, living conditions are very different from workers. Um, there has to be a very different way of um, reaching out to them and talking to them. I know, for instance, that in um, in in India, very close to um, um, in in Bangladesh's neighboring country, you know, there there's been this uh, huge movement of what they call I forget what uh, what it's called, but it's a union of the unemployed and like small vendors, uh, uh, informal workers. Uh, in, in India, they've been, they've been, they've been, they tried to organize them and they've become one of the largest um, political organizations and most important political forces uh, in India. And I think there are similar efforts to do the same here. I understand Dr. Roselis maybe um, is involved in some of these initiatives, but clearly I think I think I do think though that there it isn't a question of um, is it workers? Do we focus on um, industrialized workers or traditional workers, or do we focus on um, you know these new informal workers? I think they need to work together in part because um, you know in reality many of these families actually have one worker in the industrial zones, another worker in the informal zone. So um, I think there are definitely ways by which. Both groups um, are uh, can work together, especially because in many cases they face the same um, challenges and problems. For example, the issue of um, expensive um, utilities, privatized water, for example, that's something that both workers and um, and urban poor or informal workers can can work together to to counter. Thank you, uh, Dr. Desena. Uh, at this juncture, we would like to remind our uh, participants that we will be extending 
for 10 to 15 minutes because as we survey the chat box and the Facebook uh, comment uh, section, there are a lot of important questions that uh, need to be addressed. And with the indulgence of our two resource speakers, uh, if they may permit us to extend, uh, we would be happy to do that. No? Okay lang. Would that be okay with you, Dr. Dusena and Dr. Sabur, if we extend that's for fine. like 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's um, okay. All right. This day, okay. But um, this is just one of those things with Zoom. So someone who's picking up my laundry is here right now and he's <laughs> ringing the doorbell. So I have to attend to that because, yeah, I feel, I feel bad for the person who's outside and it's raining. So if you give me like just two minutes, maybe Dr. Sabur can answer first. Certainly, um, certainly. Yeah. These are realities we have to face, Dr. Desena. This is the right. new normal we're in. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Sabur? Yeah, um, so, uh, so uh, Dr. Rosales, uh, thank you for your question. I, um, so I'm also a part of the trade union movement. Um, I'm closely, I've been working with them. Um, so it, as you said, and, and as you clearly mentioned that these, they're not a uh, worker. Um, now, let me give you the reality from Bangladesh. Um, the slums and the squatters um, that we see around and that there is an informal economy and there's a social life happening there. But the problem is that even the uh, in, within that informal economy, it, it, there's a penetration of NGOs. And um, I don't know uh, where to place myself, but the thing is like the, the university that I, I work in, and we have one of the largest slum just behind the university. And uh, that is pretty much controlled by Bragg, by the way. So it's, it's like a small social laboratory. Um, and there's a there's a public private enterprise uh, partnership that that is the lingo that development world is shifting towards. Um, uh, and I I think I think it would be increasingly impossible to organize any movement unless until there's a life threat, and that has been the case. Okay, because these NGOs are 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 actually replacing the state. Uh, delivering the service, partnering with um, not WASA but private water water supply, and private other private um, service supplier. So if you look into uh, last few years of our <clears throat> UN mandate, uh, this this whole making market uh, work for poor, this uh, this this uh, assertion on the service delivery has also uh, shaped the kind of uh, responses we would see from the neoliberal regime and people countering those, those as well. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we, we saw the movements of whatever kind of movements only happen when there was the slum burning. Whether in, in Kalshi, whether uh, the Korai, the, the, the slum that I've just mentioned, uh, the only movement was possible when was absolutely their life, not livelihood, their life was threatened. Their livelihood and life was threatened. And, uh, and this, this, is, this is very interesting is, is that this, in, this, this penetration of NGO made absolutely any resistance impossible in the slums. Because you are delivering the services. I mean, what what else do you need? They would neuter any possible. So the thing is, like when you we talk about NGO as as a radical force, NGO has never been a radical force. Let's not all NGOs are the same. There is there are some NGOs which which are radical, but most of the NGOs, even Bragg, is not a radical force. It has its own interest. It has its own policies to push. It has its own ideas of how development should look like. And that is anything but promoting any kind of movements. That's not going to happen as long as the NGO presence is there. So uh, I don't know how, how organizing can be possible. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be, it must not be a life-threatening situation where um, all the slum dwellers uh, unifies and, and raise their voices and actually fight the oligarchy. So they have actually stopped clearing up the slum a couple of times. They, they've managed to do that. But that was not because of NGO. But there are some NGOs like Nigeria, Korea, and others who actually 
um, teach the, uh, the small holders to organize, how to organize. They actually uh, teach them how to resist, how to negotiate with the, with the local power and how to claim their space. Bragg does that too, but, but with, the, with this new development paradigm, this public-private partnership, that is becoming difficult for for NGOs, uh, for um, any movement to happen on on the ground. Um, I have a similar experience in trade union movement. Trade union movement is is, is almost impossible because when we talk of the garment strongly, I'm part of the garment solidarity. When we are talking about the solidarity of the garments worker, we are not even allowed to enter the premises without having our license. And our license is impossible to have because we are a movement organization. We are not. Uh, how you call it, uh, BGME vetted uh, organization. So the trade union that you see even within the garments factories are actually intermediary between the, uh, between the worker and the uh, owner and who talks about the uh, own, owner's interest, not worker's interest. So it's, it's the intermediary. It's, it's so, so this, is the, this is the reality that we're living now. So we really need to re-envision or what kind of movement we want to see. And the thing is like, and, and the, another problem that I probably didn't make clear enough or, or, or clarify that much is that all the movements, be it trade union movement, be it uh, left movement, be it any forms of movement, still, at least in Bangladesh, is middle-class driven. It's the language that we speak, we, the, the language of justice, the language of equality, that uh, this, is, this is still the middle class driven. So uh, the indigenous voices are there when it is aligning with that language. So that is also, also something that we need to think about. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabur. Um, checking the questions that have been posted so far, there have been a lot of questions about populism. While most of these questions are addressed to Dr. Desena, I suppose uh, Dr. Sabur can also shed some light on the subject matter uh, as we go along. So I'll try to uh, consolidate some of the questions that have been asked regarding authoritarianism and populism. No? And uh, there is a particular question here that asks, uh, what could explain the simultaneous rise of populist leaders? No? And we're not only talking about the Philippines in this regard, but uh, globally, no? across countries with diverse cultures and of different economic standings. Is this a new occurrence or are there precedents? So uh, perhaps we can uh, ask Dr. Dusena to shed some light on that, please, and then proceed right, to yeah. Dr. Sabur. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I've also been reading the questions on the chat box, no? and they're really, really interesting. Unfortunately, we have we don't have the time to address them all. So before we end, you know, like we could always continue the conversation after the seminar. I'm just around, so um, I'd like to address some of them. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So the question is, what explains the simultaneous rise of um, of these populist leaders? I think it really has to do. First of all, let's be very clear, no? These are very different populists or different authoritarian leaders. Um, Trump is very different from Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro is very different from Duterte, but there are also very striking similarities among them. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, these things that I was describing earlier, some many of them, if not most of them, we've also seen happening in other countries like Brazil. I mean, I'm not as an expert on Brazil, but I, I, I understand that they also went through a phase of neoliberalism. The, the developmental state that, um, that the Brazilian uh, elite um, tried to um, erect in the 1950s and 1960s was also dismantled to a large extent in the 1970s and 1980s. So that also led to a lot of insecurity. There's been similar changes in the class uh, structure as well in uh, between the Philippines and uh, and Turkey. Um, in, in, in the US too, you know, just having come from there, we've seen um, massive defunding of social services in the last um, uh, 20 to 30 years. And I think that has 
I, I, I would be surprised if that had nothing to do with the rise of Trump. You know, the insecurity of all these white um, working class men in particular who were instrumental in his success. I think um, that, that, you know, we're talking about, yeah, I think we, we, I, I should have um, brought it out more, the role of neoliberal globalization. Because really, these, there were forces around the world, some of them, the very same um, agencies, the very same organizations, the very same corporations, the very same organizations like the World Bank or the IMF were pushing for very similar policies across the world, be that Brazil and US, uh, the US, other developing countries, the Philippines. So I'm, it's not surprising that you have very different expressions of um, a very common phenomena, such as the rise of these uh, populist leaders. But yeah, I mean, there are particularities here that um, we need to be attentive um, to as well. Thank you, Dr. DeSena. Dr. Savor, your thoughts, please. Um, so I think uh, we've just uh, uh, had a Shabak uprising, which is the most recent populist movement. We had three uh, consecutive uh, populist movement. One was Shabak uprising, uh, that uh, another was ro on road safety, another one was uh, um, the government imposing quota and um, all of this were populist in nature and um what 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 i have discussed in 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 my other paper which i've just finished um uh, for um field sites um and that is on populism uh actually what in in bangladeshi cases the what i discuss is is this this uh the populist demand actually disguise the deep distrust of established power structure um, that has given the rise and, 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 and distrust not only in power structure but in the elite as well and exposing the contradictions and abject failure of party politics for all, all everyone to see. So, so populist movement is, is, is a repercussion of failure of state, um, uh, the, the political structure, uh, elite and, and and, and party failure of party politics. So we do not have the, the radical, not forget about radicalism, but party politics, the antagonistic forces in the field. And that is giving rise to this populist movement. And, and that is what I've discussed. And, and this, this uh, apparently nonviolent movement grows rapidly, uh, especially attracting the secular educated middle class and, and soon becoming this largest populist. Yeah. So these are the easier demand to press. I mean, and these are, these are um, as we see, this, these are, these are manifestation of transversal politics as well. You are, you are uh, coming together uh, for a particular issue and then, then that, that demand is met, you're, you're leaving the, the field. Um, but what, are, and, and and the thing is like this 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 what you are doing is that you you make the corporeal uh, substance of social life felt as as Mazzarella would discuss and and prevailing institution of mediation but then it doesn't last for long that is the problem and that is the problem I have had with the populist movement is that that it is even whether it's Occupy movement whether it's Starbuck movement whether it's Arab Spring it doesn't bring a sustainable change for the longer period of time. You need to bring back the ideologically led movement along with the transversal politics. So my position here is that this is not the one-off thing that is happening now. This is not the symptomatic of neoliberal development. Yes, it is somewhat symptomatic, but populist movement has been part of history uh, but what we see is the de-radicalization of, of political forces, which is problematic. And I think I'm one of the last uh, pragmatic radical who still believe that you need to have sustained political system. I mean, I mean you need to have a sustained uh, radical voices and, 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 and a political system that works, that functions. I mean, you cannot have interest-driven, profit-driven, capitalist, uh, neoliberal forces push you around and, and, and say yes to everything they do. I mean, you have to, at some point of time, you cannot live this life. It's not possible. And, and the thing is, uh, just only uh, bringing the brilliant and most sophisticated theories doesn't solve the problem. You need to figure out what is the problem within the field so that 
I mean, you don't have to be the radical forces, but at least be, show it to the people who can take up from there and, and have their movement and, and organize the way they, they please. So that is, that is, I think, as a social scientist or an anthropologist, an activist anthropologist, that, that, is, that is my calling and that is what, what I would be interested in doing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabor. Um, at this juncture, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Dusena, uh, we, as much as possible, would like to address all these interesting and insightful questions. But in the interest of time, unfortunately, uh, we have to end. And again, I would like to invite our resource speakers to give their final remarks before we conclude the program. Uh, we will try our best to get back to you with uh, answers to your questions should our resource speakers' schedules permit. No? But in the meantime, we would uh, like to hear the closing remarks of our two distinguished uh, guests for this afternoon. Okay. Uh, we can begin with uh, Dr. Dusena and wrap it up with Dr. Sabur. Well, first of all, um... It's so, uh, I think it's very interesting or yeah, it, it, it reminds us of just how important um, this, the topic is that we're talking about. That as we were having this discussion, I just read, um, uh, someone just sent me a message that a very important high ranking leader of the left um, had just been gunned down or killed, stabbed to death yata, um, in, in, the past, uh, in the past hour. So that just shows you, um, I think that I would be very surprised if this, not, this isn't politically motivated, of, we don't know yet, but there have been many killings of, first of all, of the um, su suspected drug uh, peddlers and drug addicts the past, there's been thousands of them. And we've also seen over the past a few months that more and more activists are being targeted with the anti-terror law. Um, it's, I think, there it's just a matter of time before they go after, you know, scholars, professors, students, many of our students might be targeted as well. So it's really important that we think about um, how we are going to uh, fight this, uh, this worrying uh, trend uh, in the short term, but also in the long term. And um, I, I appreciate all of the questions. I wish I could address them. Um, uh, um, so I, I guess I'll just end by saying that, um, by emphasizing that the, 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 the reason why we're facing this uh, problem is, has to do, has, is systemic. No, it has to do with the kind of society that we have, the kind of society that we live in. And so the, in order for us to be effective, we cannot, uh, it's important to educate people, it's important to address fake news, but it's also important to think about and to present alternatives, because I think this is what people are looking for. If not the DDS, if not the Dilawan, then what kind of systemic alternative, what better society can we, um, can we build so that we um, avoid um, dictatorship and finally um, really um, achieve substantive democracy. So thank you for inviting me, um, Dr. Didiste, and thank you, um, Dr. Melissa. Thank you to the class. Um, I look forward to continuing this discussion with some of you. Feel free to email me um, if, if you want to talk some more. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dusena, for your generosity and for the time you spent with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Sabu? Um, I think uh, I've made my position very clear. I don't think any... Um, uh, anything is possible, any change is possible unless until we activate the change. Um, and, and so whether you, you talk about deglobalization um, or, or democracy, uh, nothing comes free. And, and also, um, I think I'm one of those skeptics as well who, uh, who like to place the blame on others, but I think we need to uh, see our agency and what we have created as a society um, and, and I think uh, we need to hold ourselves culpable for, for what we see today. And it's important to take the responsibility. It's important to, uh, to, to envision any kind of change, whether it's the globalization or anything, you need to be invested in. You need to see it as your problem, as your own problem and address accordingly. You need to build alliances. You need to have, uh, whether it's ideologically led polit politics or transversal politics, it really doesn't matter, but political 
uh, culture has to has 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 to retain right and 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 an environment where we can hold people accountable people in power accountable that is necessary um so i uh, i don't know how uh, you in your situation will do that but we have to keep pushing uh, we have to keep pushing we have to keep dreaming and and uh, and most importantly we need to keep fighting because without fight, we do have this Digi Digital Security Act uh, where, where more and more um, scholars are silenced, journalists are silenced, you can't say anything. You, you, you cannot, uh, even historical document, you have to portray in certain ways, otherwise you are, you are in, in the red. So these are the things, these, these are the political climate we are living in and we really need to wake up and see out of our self-interest and see that that we have created this dysfunctional society all of us we are equally culpable it's not the government or the state or the system that you can blame for but you and i didn't act on time and that is very important to act uh, now and to fight on that and and that that's 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 the thing that i want to finish with i mean i mean in my discussion um here uh, but I'm really, really happy that this question came in. It allowed us to um, articulate better and more because in 15 minutes time, you cannot possibly say everything that you want to. Um, and thank you for your interesting questions, engaging questions. And thank you, um, uh, Dr. Levisay for inviting us and Melissa for all the supports and, and, and uh, Mary for all the support. And, uh, and I think it was uh, Dr. Dosena's work and my work are very different, but at the same time, it complemented each other in, in certain ways. So I really, really like that. And so yeah, it was a, it was, it was a privilege uh, being here. And I'm, um, I would love to uh, respond to any questions. Just send me the link uh, in a live session where I can, I can just engage there, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sabur. And at this point, we would like to thank everyone who participated in our webinar session today. Uh, stay tuned for more webinar sessions. Uh, we would like to thank uh, the SOCDEV 203.4 class in social theory and development and transdisciplinary development for attending this session. Your questions were immensely appreciated. We would like to thank the organizers behind these webinar series, uh, Dr. Medisa Navara, Mr. Carl Reyes, and the members and officers of the Kalipunang Sociologia and Anthropologia of the Ateneo DSA. And finally, we would like to thank our online learning communities we have established contacts with over the course of a month now. Please continue to support us. Please continue to uh, uh, join us in these stimulating and uh, profound conversations with uh, uh, renowned and uh, endearing uh, colleagues of ours from a range of social sciences. So on that note, thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank Both you. Are fantastic. Irvi and Shuti, thank you very You're much. Back. Really appreciate it. I am indebted to you guys. Yeah. Oh, no. so you can thank make you. me do anything now. <laughs>